Good day, everyone, and welcome. My name is Dan Sanpeo, and I'm delighted to welcome you to today's Mondap webinar in association with Gun Plus Partners. We are joined today by a brilliant panel. Celine Erchias joined the firm in 2006 and became a partner in 2014. She specialises in life sciences and intellectual property with a special focus on patents and utility models. Celine has been involved in a number of advisory and litigation matters in all fields of IP and has handled hundreds of contentious and non-contentious administrative oppositions and court actions involving intellectual property rights, particularly in relation with prote protection of patent rights. Isel Yatkin joined the firm in 2008 and became a partner in 2020. She specialises in intellectual property with a special focus on patents and utility models. With 12 years of experience on patents, she has been providing consultancy on all matters related to the patent law and has been leading numerous patent actions. And completing today's panel is Ida Tahala. Ida is an associate at Bristow's LLP, having joined the firm in 2013 and qualified in 2015. She specialises in intellectual property litigation and her patent dispute practice is predominantly in the life sciences sector. Ida has experience in patent disputes before the English courts, as well as global life cycle management projects regarding small molecule, antibody pharmaceutical and drug device products. Celine, Isel and Ida make up the preeminent panel for today's webinar and will discuss the top patent cases of 2020 in Turkey with a UK perspective. Now, before we get started, here is how you can get involved in today's event. You have the opportunity to submit questions to today's presenters by typing them into the questions pane of the control panel. You may send in your questions at any time during the presentation and we'll address as many as possible during our Q&A session at the end of today's presentation. I would now like to hand over to our speakers, Celine, Isel and Ida, to begin today's webinar. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Dan, and hello, everyone. Welcome to today's session. Um, as Dan also mentioned today, we'd like to celebrate the World IP Day in our own way, of course, and for this purpose, we wanted to share with you um, the most interesting patent cases of 2020 in Turkey, which are seasoned with the UK perspective on these matters by valuable contribution of IDA. Um, we'll do our best to fit in one hour and spare some time for possible comments or questions from your side. Well, I think that's all, so we can get started. Um, slide one, please, then Erin. <laughs> Sorry about it. Okay. Um, so today we will be covering uh, four important cases, let me say, that we deem important for 2020 in Turkey. The first one is about the compensation action for employees' invention. And the second one is about a precautionary injunction decision granted upon the implementation of Article 86, which is about indirect use of an invention. Third one is about um, sending warning letters and facing with unfair competition acquisition and the decision of uh, commercial court on that aspect. Finally, the last but not the least one, uh, the direct import of generic drugs and the patent infringement situation arising in such cases. So after summarizing all four cases, or at least giving the headlines, I'm giving the floor to Isel to hear about the story behind the first case. Thank you very much, Sinam. Uh, I would like to talk about a compensation claim based on employees in mansion. Uh, but before I go into the details of the case, I would like to give you some information related to legal basis of such compensation claims. If there is an invention based on employees' work while employees working at the facility, it's called employee invention. There are some obligations on both employee and employer side. Employer must inform the employer immediately uh, about the invention and employer uh, also must get back to the employee within uh, four months with his decision either full or partial rights employer is also under the uh, fair and reasonable payment obligation ip law and implementation of ip law regulates the details of the payment methods and ratios 
uh, both IP law and implementation uh, IP law addresses a few criteria while calculating the amount of compensation. These are economic value of the invention, employees' position in the factory, and contribution of the factory uh, and business. Uh, so now I can move to the case. Uh, based on our knowledge, it is the first dispute that was resolved by the arbitration. Uh, the plaintiff employee side was one of the inventors of the invention. Uh, since the employer didn't want to pay anything to the employee inventor, em employee initiated the court proceedings. First inventor went to the IP court, uh, but the defendant side, the employer side, mean, uh, raised an arbitration objection and requested the court to procedurally dismiss the case. Uh, which should be handled by the arbitration. Although employee side opposed these arbitration objections, and uh, but the IP court accepted this uh, procedural arbitration objection and dismissed the case. Uh, there is a provision addressing the arbitration procedure related to such disputes, but uh, legally speaking, we think the wording of the provisions should not be considered that arbitration is a mandatory way to apply. Uh, but unfortunately, this district court also upheld the decision of the IP court. Uh, then inventor proceed to arbitration procedure before the Istanbul Arbitration Center. There were too many difficulties that inventor, uh, in, uh, inventor faced during this uh, arbitration procedure. Uh, the defendant side even wanted to discuss whether the plaintiff, I mean the employee, was one of the inventors of the patent, uh, etc. So, um, although uh, the employee requested the arbitrator uh, not to uh, apply the implementation of IP law because, uh, because of some unjust calculation methods and ratios, but the arbitrator said this is the only regulation to be considered while calculating the uh, compensation amount. Uh, IP law uh, says that compensation amount should be fair and reasonable. This is most important point that we need to consider uh, because unfortunately the rates in the implementation of IP law is quite, I mean, it's very far from being fair and reasonable. Employee claimed that the employer side sold the uh, patented product over uh, 95 uh, profit margin uh, and also expert panel also determined uh, that uh, uh, this sold patent product uh, profit margin quite high is over 90 percent uh, but since the rates in the implementation of IP law are unfairly low the result, uh, the compensation amount at the end, uh, very ridiculous. Uh, sorry to say that, but it, it is the you know fact. Uh, gross rate due to the patented product was five million Turkish liras, uh, and arbitration decision was only uh, six thousand Turkish liras. But since, as I said, it's very far from being reasonable and fair, the arbitrator uses discretion and increase the amount to uh, 30,000 Turkish Liras, uh, considering the principle of fair and reasonable. That's it. Yeah, thank you, Esa. Um, I, I, I would like to say that it is a really sad story because um, irrespective from the meaning of legal terms or the provisions, you know, to calculate the um, the, the reasonable or fair compensation amount for in, in return to the employee's invention. Just looking at the matter from the numerical perspective, from mathematical perspective, you say that the company gained five million per year, and depending on the um, the monopoly, of course, provided by the patent right, and it was only six thousand Turkish liras that was calculated as per to the regulation. Uh, and uh, that was the uh, amount that was considered to be the fair and reasonable for the uh, inventor, for the employer. I do not think that it is that uh, fair, actually. Um, but of course, um, um, it may change in future. I still have hope. But having said that, I would like to turn to Ida to ask what the situation in UK is when it comes to employee inventions. 
Thank you, Celine. Thank you, Aisal. Yep. So um, under English law, the Patents Act does provide um, a system where an employee may be entitled to compensation for an invention to be paid by the employer. Um, can I have the next slide, please? Uh, and maybe one more, sorry. <laughs> So the statute um, sets us out under sections 39 to 43. Basically, the circumstances in which an employee may get compensation um, and the conditions depend on whether the invention is owned by the employer or the employee. And section 39, which I won't go into, um, sets out when an employer's or employee's inventions actually belong to the employer. So for inventions belonging to the employer, under section 40, the court may award compensation where the employer has made an invention for which a patent has been granted and which having regard to the size and nature of the employer's undertaking is of outstanding benefit to the employer and where it's just for compensation to be awarded. Um, similarly, for inventions belonging to the employee, uh, the employee must have assigned it to its employer for inadequate benefit and it must be just for the uh, employee to be awarded compensation. So how much compensation might be awarded? Well section 41 tells us that it's the amount that would secure for the employee a fair share having regard to all the circumstances of the benefit that the employee employer um, derived from the invention and the act gives us some factors which you should take into account when you want to figure out what a fair share is. So these factors include the nature of the employee's duties and the um, benefits and salary it obtained, the effort and skill that the employee put into developing the invention and the effort and skill of anyone else who also contributed, as well as the employer's contribution to the making, developing and working of the invention. And finally, it's important to note that there is a UK link here. So under section 43, the compensation provisions will only apply to an invention that was made where the employee was mainly employed in the UK or where the employer had a place of business in the UK to which the employee was attached. These provisions have been um, very rarely litigated. In fact, there are only two decisions granting compensation under the statute, but the latest of these was a Supreme Court decision in 2019 um, in the case Shanks and Unilever. Next slide, please. In fact, Shank's case lasted about 13 years, so it's uh, quite a long drama. But basically, the facts are that Professor Ian Shanks worked for Unilever UK Central Resources Limited for about four years in the 80s. Unilever UK basically employed the UK-based research staff, and it was a wholly owned subsidiary of Unilever PLC. And while employed, he came up with an invention for biosensors for measuring blood glucose levels. And under the Act, um, that invention belonged to its, his employer, Unilever UK, who then assigned it to the PLC for £100. But the PLC then patented and licensed it out, making £24 million over the years. So Professor Shanks applied for compensation, arguing that um, the patents had been of outstanding benefit and that he was entitled to a fair share. He actually lost all the way until the this, uh, case reached the Supreme Court. Next slide, please. Um, so at the Supreme Court, Lord Kitchen decided that the employer you have to think about here is the actual employer, i.e. Unilever UK. And as to the meaning of what is an outstanding benefit, that should be given its ordinary English meaning, i.e. something that's exceptional or stand out. And in considering the size and nature of the employer's undertaking, which the uh, statute tells us we have to take into account, the Supreme Court said you need to look at the commercial reality of the situation. So here Unilever UK's undertaking, this business, was to develop inventions and license it to the group or assign it to the group. And so you have to think about to what extent is the benefit uh, to the group of this particular uh, patent outstanding compared to the benefit the group has gained from other patents that Unilever UK uh, has assigned to the group. Next slide, please. Uh, the court wasn't impressed with the argument that £24 million isn't outstanding when you compare it to the billions that Unilever PLC makes from its other products. This has been referred to as its too big to pay um, argument and said that the tribunal should be very cautious before accepting something uh, along those lines. And so on the facts, the court decided that um, having regard to Unilever UK's undertaking, the invention was of outstanding benefit. It was significant that even though Unilever PLC made an effort to license uh, the inventions, it wasn't actually the size and nature of Unilever PLC's business that, that resulted in the benefit coming from the licenses. And um, so the court awarded 
uh, sorry, 5% of the overall uh, net uh, profit, which amounted to £2 million, uh, adjusted for the big amount of time that passed between when the invention was created and, and the Supreme Court decision. Thank you. Thank you, Ida. Well, apparently the figures in UK law are much more satisfying and close to be fair. But I, I just, I have a question, a quick one. Is there an upper limit in UK law saying that the, uh, I mean, you cannot exceed this amount when you are calculating, you know, the compensation for an employer's invention? Is there such an um, upper limit? Thank you. Yeah, not that I'm aware of it. The fair amount no, isn't yeah. capped on the statute. Yeah. Yeah. It will depend well, on the facts. Yeah, in our case, I mean, in our law, there is such an uh, upper limit on one hand, and on the other hand, I can see that there was a five percentage of um, uh, revenue, let me say, calculated in favor of the employer inventor, and in our case, it was something like 0 0.01 or something like that. It was really very, very minimal. Okay, um, so next slide, please. Aaron, thank you. Um, so this new case uh, will be touched by me. It's about a precautionary injunction against indirect use of an invention. I have to first say that um, that it is not very quite often that we get precautionary injunction decisions from the Turkish IP course. So this is one of the things that is important about this decision. But um, it is much more important because it is uh, the first example of implementation of Article 86, uh, which you can see on the screen right now, talking and ruling about prevention of indirect use of an invention. The wording is kind of complicated, but I assume that it is very similar with the German law, UK law, there are some kind of uh, similar provisions. So it may be helpful for all of us to understand it better. Mainly it says that the patent owner is entitled to prevent third persons from giving the elements related with a part of an invention which enables the implementation of the invention and constitutes the essence of the invention to persons who are not authorized to use the invention. And in order to be able to implement this paragraph, the third persons must know that these elements are sufficient to implement the invention and they will be used for these purposes. Or this condition should be sufficiently clear from circumstances. So if we all understand what Article 86 is talking about, we can park it aside for a minute because I would like to tell you about the scope of protection of the patent in question. And I just remember that I Forgot to say, next slide, please, Aaron. Thank you. Now I'm here, the scope of protection of the patent in question. So the patent is a combination patent, which is um, disclosing and protecting combination of active ingredients, let's say A and B. So accordingly, combination partner A is one of the main elements of the invention. And as per to the wording of claim one, and as well as according to the description of the patent, any combined use of A and B falls within the scope of protection conferred by the patent. So it's very important for all of us to understand that claim one is not limited with a fixed dose combination. So what does the generic company do? The generic company markets a pharmaceutical, very innocent, the generic drug containing the active ingredient A only. And it has a second label, which does not mention about the combination use. However, due to some reasons that I will explain in a minute, the patent owner believes that the generic company is indirectly using the invention and unfairly capturing the market for the patented combination. So the arguments of the, gen uh, of the uh, patent owner was, first of all, the, that the generic company, as the third person within the meaning of Article 86, sells the generic product containing active ingredient A only, which constitutes the essential element of the patent to unauthorized persons like pharmacists or pharmaceutical warehouses. And the generic company knows that the essential element of the invention, namely APIA, is sufficient to implement the invention and it is used for these purposes. Um, where argumentation part was, uh, let me say, easy but more important when you're asking a precautionary injunction, you have to bring the evidence um, proving that 
there is this indirect use. So what was the evidence? First of all, the patent owner submitted to the court um, some scientific reports indicating why it is quite rare to use the active ingredient A only, I mean, in isolation for the purpose treatment and why it is generally combined with active ingredient B in practice. So scientifically, the report was explaining the needs of the patient population and um, the, the factual uh, actual facts about the uh, about the patients how to use this active ingredient A and B, and uh, the patent owner also conducted some determinations on certain websites via public notary on which generic product was promoted to be used with APIB. So these were the evidence that could be summoned and collected by the patent owner, but some very important evidence. Uh, must have been um, summoned by the IP court. So upon demand of the patent owner, the IP, I, the IP court accepted sending a writ to one of the biggest state hospitals in Istanbul, asking about the ratio of treating patients with APIA only, which means with the generic drug only, and with the patented combination, which means generic drug plus API B. And the hospital responded that among 499 patients with the purpose disease, only five patients received APIA as monotherapy for the treatment. Rest was given combination therapy as disclosed in the patent. Again, upon demand of the patent owner, the court sent a writ to the Social Security Institute, this time asking about the number of prescriptions submitted to the institution in which the generic product was prescribed as monotherapy, as well as the number of prescriptions, of course, in which the generic product was prescribed with APIB. So the response of Social Security Institute said that there are 156 prescriptions of generic product and 43 of them, uh, in 43 of them, the generic product was prescribed alone as monotherapy. And in 113 of them, the generic product was prescribed together with APIB. So uh, actually evidence did establish actual use of the patent and combination. So the patent owner could support and I, I think prove it is positioned very well. Um, at this stage, I should really, I, I should really want to emphasize one point, the scope of the precautionary injunction demand, because it was not about preventing the, uh, you know, generic drug, which consists only APIA, uh, from being commercialized for monotherapy purposes. And it was uh, clearly stated in the PI demand uh, to prevent any kind of, you know, unfair competition or, you know, prevention of competition accusations. Um, in its decision, the court stated that the conditions of PI have been emerged and decided for, this part is important, prevention of reimbursement of generic product when it is prescribed with APIB by the Social Security Institute. So the um, aim of the IP court was, you know, it was targeting directly formulation of the combination. So uh, it thought that, I think it was a nice thought, by the way, it thought that if I stop the reimbursement, then it will not be used together. Uh, in, it, it doesn't matter, by the way, the court made this explanation. It doesn't matter if these A and B were in the same prescription. Uh, but of course, the other scenario was very difficult to prove because you cannot track uh, if there are two different prescriptions. You cannot track when the, um, the one including APIA was submitted and if both of them were submitted for the same patient, etc. This was problematic, of course, but at least when they are in the same prescription, there, were, there would be no reimbursement. As I said, it was the first exa example as far as we know, but I think it is really the first example of implementation of Article 86. It, uh, it, it makes this decision quite interesting, but there are two other things which makes this decision really interesting. One of them is uh, the the IP court granted the PI upon an on-file examination, which means that there was no court-appointed expert examination. And the IP court did not order for a guarantee bond, which also makes this decision quite a unique one. Um, after PI, of course, that uh, decision uh, was given upon an action on merits, including the PI demand. So the action on merits is still ongoing, and I think we will see what is coming next. Um, 
soon, but I can say that the main defense of the generic company so far is that the APIA is a staple product that can be generally found on the market. Therefore, in the lack of inducement of the generic company, you know, to have the unauthorized persons used API A in combination with API B, there cannot be an indirect use of the invention. This is the defense of the generic company. As we have no case law about, uh, you know, the elements of Article 86, uh, we have no guidance to interpret what a staple product is under Turkish law. Uh, and there is nothing in doctrine either. So uh, we have kind of difficulties there. And uh, this the decision at the end of the um, first instance court will be the first light on that issue. Uh, but I know that uh, in UK, uh, there are some other um, sample or precedent decisions in which the staple product was also interpreted. So I would like to turn to Ida again uh, first to ask if I, I UK courts also give such fantastic decisions because this one was really fantastic. And <laughs> more importantly, what is this uh, interpretation on the indirect use and staple product in the UK? Sure, thank you very much, Selin. Um, happily, next slide, please. So yeah, under the English law, we've got uh, indirect infringement set out under section 60, subsection two of the Patents Act. Likewise, it's a little bit um, complicated, shall we say, but um, basically a person infringes a patent if without the owner's consent and while the patent's in force, he supplies or offers to supply in the UK a, a person other than an authorized person, any of the means relating to an essential element of the invention for putting the invention into effect when he knows or it's obvious uh, to a reasonable person in the circumstances that those means are suitable for and intended to put the invention into effect in the UK. Next slide, please. So as you can see, there are quite a few key concepts here. Um, the first is that it must be a means relating to an essential element of the invention. And on this, we have guidance from the High Court on a decision um, between Nestec and Dulit, in which the court decided that the supply of disposable coffee capsules were the means relating to an essential element of an invention for a coffee making machine. And that's because they contributed to implementing the technical teaching of the invention. As for the next requirement that there must be a means suitable for putting the invention into effect, this basically requires that the person who obtains the means either makes a product falling within the claims or uses the means in a process falling within the claims. And again, Nestec provides guidance on this. So in that case, the judge decided that the coffee capsules were not means suitable for putting the invention into effect. And he had regard to a few factors. So the first of that was that the capsules were an entirely subsidiary part of the claimed coffee making machine system. Um, the coffee capsules and the coffee machine had their independent commercial existences and the capsules were consumables. And so the consumer would expect that they could get them from whichever source they pleased. And also the capsules didn't embody the inventive concept of the patent. And Turning next to the knowledge requirement, we also have guidance from the courts on this. The leading case on this is the Court of Appeal decision in Grimmer against Scott, where the court said that the requirement is met if at the time of the supply of the means in question, the ultimate users will intend to put the invention into effect. And it doesn't really matter whether the ultimate intention hasn't been formed yet, as long as it's more likely than not that future users will have a future intention. Um, so next slide, please. As Celine mentioned, we also have a exception for staple commercial products, and that's under section 60, subsection three. So supply of such products will not constitute indirect infringement unless the supply is for the purpose of inducing the person supplied to infringe. Next slide, please. So we do have fortunately some guidance from the Nestec case where the High Court said that a useful working definition of a staple commercial product is a product that's of a kind that's needed every day and can be generally obtained. The judge went on to state that in order to qualify as a staple commercial product, a product must ordinarily be one which is supplied commercially for a variety of uses. And one of our leading uh, patent law textbooks, Terrell, suggests that staple presumably means raw materials. So next slide, please. Indirect infringement has been argued in England and Wales in numerous pharmaceutical cases. And recently, this has mainly been in the context of second medical use claims. Interestingly, the courts have found that indirect infringement applies slightly differently depending on whether the claims are Swiss form or EPC 2000. 
So very briefly, listeners may be aware that Swiss form claims are in the format, the use of compound X in the manufacture of a medicament for treating disease Y, and they are generally accepted as being purpose-limited process claims, whereas EPC 2000 claims are in the format substance X for use as a medicament, and those are purpose-limited product claims. So turning first to how uh, indirect infringement has been argued in Swiss in regard to Swiss form claims, the first case I'd like to talk about very briefly is Eli Lilly and Octavis. Here, Lilly was the owner of a patent claiming the use of disodium salt of pemetrexid, so a particular salt form of the active ingredient pemetrexid, in the manufacture of a medicament for use in combination with vitamin B12 for treating cancer. And Actavis, meanwhile, had three proposed products with different salts of pemetrexid than the one claimed. And it sought a declaration of non-infringement for those. But Lilly argued that Actavis's product would indirectly infringe because when it was supplied to a doctor or pharmacist, they would dissolve it with saline. And as a result, the particular claimed form of pemetrexid disodium would result. Um, since there is sodium ions in the saline solution. The Supreme Court agreed that um, this would amount to indirect infringement. Actavis's product did constitute the means relating to an essential element of the invention, and Actavis had admitted that it would have been obvious to uh, dissolve the product in saline and to use it with B12, and they admitted that they knew that was the case, so that satisfied the mental element too. But it Indirect infringement was also considered in Warner, Lambert and Generics. And here, Warner owned a patent with Swiss form claims to the use of pregabalin in treating pain. Now, Actavis sought to uh, sell a generic pregabalin product but with a skinny label, which didn't include the pay, uh, treatment for pain. However, Warner argued that it was likely to be used off label and that Therefore, when the pharmacist dispensed the product to the patient, that would be indirect infringement. Um, so on this, the Supreme Court actually held the patent to be not valid, so its judgment on infringement is obiter, but it did say that if it had been valid, the patent would not have been infringed. It decided that the invention is not the use of the active ingredient for the claimed uh, disease, but the manufacture of the active for the claimed use. And so since these claims were to the process of manufacture, there was actually no act of manufacture by any party after Actavis made the product, even though the pharmacist would be putting the particular label on the product. And so even though the court had no difficulty in accepting that the active ingredient was a means relating to an essential element of the invention, it wasn't suitable for putting the invention into effect. Next slide, please. But if we then consider how the courts have dealt with this in relation to EPC 2000 claims. Um, the courts have confirmed that indirect infringement can apply to even acts downstream of manufacture. So in Akibia and Fibrogen, a case from last year, Fibrogen had two families of patents to classes of enzyme inhibitors for treating uh, certain classes of anemia. And Fibrogen argued there was threatened infringement because Akibia was planning to launch a product. And although the proposed MA didn't include uh, the particular class of anemia for the patent in question, uh, Fibrogen argued that the patent was uh, the product was likely to be used off label for the uh, claimed class of anemia. And the judge confirmed that with EPC 2000 claims, unlike Swiss form claims, they can be infringed in acts downstream of manufacturing. Um, on the facts, though, indirect infringement was not found because it, the facts didn't make it likely that off-label use uh, would occur. And finally, going back to the question of what is the meaning of staple commercial product under English law, and in particular in pharma cases, it's significant to note that in none of these cases was it argued that, that the active pharmaceutical ingredient was a staple commercial product. And I think that very fact speaks uh, volumes of the meaning under English law. Thank you. Thank you, Ida. This is really very helpful. We already co cooperated um, on this file, so I am very happy to have this helpful case law from UK law because, yeah, it is uh, on one hand seems very easy to explain that uh, an active ingredient can no way be deemed as a you know a staple product. Uh, but on the other hand, in the lack of any guidance and any case law, you find yourself in a position that, well, it is not a raw material. It is not, you know, a, something that you can find in your storage, you know, as a you know, business person. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, it is an API that is protect, uh, that is manufactured specially 
and uh, under marketing authorization, of course, the, on the other hand, so it cannot be an, um, uh, a staple product. But I think we will have some discussions in, uh, in the case uh, about this, and I'm really very curious about the outcome. Hopefully it will be a nice one. Okay, so our next case, next slide, please. Thank you. Well, our next case is very interesting, in my opinion, because, mm, okay, I'm not going to uh, give spoiler, okay. It's about unfair competition <laughs> because of sending warning letters. So, Aysa, tell us what happened. Thank you, Sinam. Uh, thank you very much. Yes, it's, it's quite interesting case, really. Uh, before uh, moving into the details of the uh, compensation action, uh, it will be better to give you some background of the case related to the patent infringement with preliminary injunction request. Uh, patent holders send a warning letter to the generic company, reminded his patent rights and request them to respect them by the expire date of the patent and also request the technical information how their formulation does not infringe the patent holders' patent rights. Uh, but, uh, but the generic company uh, kept silent, didn't uh, get back to the patent holder. Um, the key evidence for the patent infringement proceedings is the license dossier, which kept by the Minister of Health Agency as a confidential. Uh, so uh, the patent holder is not allowed to access this evidence on its own, uh, as a court uh, decision of the court is needed to access this evidence. Um, patent holder also uh, waited, you know, around a couple of uh, weeks since the patent holder didn't get any response from the uh, generic company. Uh, they initiated the uh, court proceedings. Uh, while the patent infringement action was uh, ongoing, the patent holder also sent a warning letter to the manufacturing company for the sole purpose of informing it about the ongoing legal action. Uh, as act of manufacturing, uh, the infringing products also constitute patent infringement. Uh, the patent owner requested the manufacturing company only to watch out the patent rights with a very sensitive tone considering the antitrust law and inform them uh, about the case and the patent holder's right. Uh, the manufacturer uh, also get back to the patent holder and ask a few questions about the uh, pending action. The patent holder responded to their questions and particularly stress on the fact that there is no any preliminary injunction issued by the court to prevent generic company to launch uh, its product. Uh, the response letter uh, did not include any comment or evaluation. It was purely included the facts and the current status of the uh, pending infringement action. Uh, following the examination on the license dossiers uh, and the expert uh, report, expert panel confirmed that there was no patent infringement, the patent holder fairly asked the court to terminate the uh, court proceedings immediately, I mean, without any further um, examination. Uh, at, I don't want to give too much details about the procedural issues, but uh, at the end uh, of the uh, patent infringement action, uh, the case was uh, dismissed. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, the, then the general company uh, initiated this compensation action based on unfair competition grounds claiming that uh, pecuniary and non-pecuniary damages. Uh, the plaintiff alleged that due to the uh, patent infringement action, uh, they couldn't launch their product and also alleging that the manufacturing company seized the production process because of the letter sent by the patent holder. As the patent holder is also one of the customers of the manufacturing company and the patent owner implicitly uh, gives some you know, uh, impact uh, on the manufacturing company. Um, so that's why the patent holder, actually the main argument uh, from the patent holder was that they use their uh, right of action based on patent rights. Uh, the expert panel and the court acknowledged that the tone of the wording of the letter was accurate, uh, but consequently the court decided that the act of sending a letter to the manufacturing company constitutes unfair competition and therefore the generic company's uh, non-pecuniary damages should be compensated. 
uh, but the court rejected the uh, pecuniary damages claim of general company since it had not been uh, proved uh, by the general company. Uh, the, the important point is that the court states that although the tone of the letter that was sent to the manufacturing company was quite accurate and fair, uh, as it only includes the facts of the case, but since the patent holder is also one of the customers of the manufacturing company and uh, a sending a, a warning letter uh, to the manufacturing company creates perception of the patent infringement, uh, the manufacture from the manufacturing side. Uh, this is against the good faith. Uh, so because of the letter, uh, let the manufacturing company to, to stop the production of uh, generic products um, creates unfair competition. So due to the reason, the court accepted the non-pecuniary damages uh, claim of generic company. Uh, but uh, we, we disagree with the decision of the court and uh, its uh, reason judgment. And uh, the case is currently before the district court, and hopefully the district court will turn over the decision of the first instance court. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Esel. Now I can speak. <laughs> so and uh, talk about the case. Well, um, first, it's my personal opinion, of course, not uh, Gunam Partners' opinion or not our patent practice group, but I do not like warning letters, and I so before um, that the warning letters, especially in patent litigation, uh, although it is not mandatory, sometimes you may consider that let's send a warning letter and let's try to find a you know out of court solution. And it always, almost always creates more fuss. I mean, this was my experience. And this time with this case, uh, we saw that, uh, I mean, it, it also created some serious problems at the unfair competition section as well let me say and i completely disagree I, I saw the recent decision and completely disagree with the court because as you just said that it acknowledged that the tone wording and the you know content of the letter is accurate but still there is unfair competition it's very difficult to understand why and i hope that the appeal court will uh, correct it and hopefully we'll see that so um Yes, our last case, last but not least case, is about um, direct import of generic pharmaceuticals and the patent infringement situation arising uh, in, in direct import of these kind of generics. Of course, um, I mean, the audience may know that direct import of generic pharmaceuticals or any pharmaceutical is not allowable because you have to have a marketing authorization in Turkey. But there is an ex exception, which is called named patient program, the abbreviation of which is MPP. So the MPP is a method that enables a pharmaceutical product to be supplied to Turkey by physicians' demand, where the, uh, the product has no marketing authorization in Turkey, or in some cases, the product may have a uh, marketing authorization in Turkey, but it may not have been marketed or launched in Turkey. So when a product is applied or approved for the MPP, then it is added to a list of Ministry of Health, which is called foreign drug list. And uh, after uh, the, the product is listed in the foreign drug list, it becomes available to be imported to Turkey, either by Social Security Institute or by the um, Turkish Pharmacist Association. Um, so um, the foreign drug list is kind of a list where you can see the name of the product, the active ingredient of the product, and the purpose of use of the product, which means that why, I mean, to treat which disease you use this product. So if you have a patent protecting the compound itself or use of that compound for a certain indication, then the statements on the foreign drug list is sufficient for you to prove that there is a patent infringement. However, um, although the uh, infringement is kind of easy to uh, prove or uh, to show, let me say, it is not easy to decide against whom uh, I'm going to file the patent infringement action because we have some actors, of course. There is this um, manufacturing company, which is mostly in all cases uh, located in abroad. And there is the importer, of course, the Social Security Institute and the Turkish Pharmacists Associ Association. And there is this um, supplier who, in fact, uh, commits the infringing act in Turkey and who is the actor that should be stopped at first place. Um, however, in almost all cases, when you apply to the, you know, to the importer, 
because uh, you don't want to sue the importer. The importer, the Social Security Institute or the Turkish Pharmacists Association is one of your customers as well. You don't want to be in bad terms with them. So you, you just want to learn about who the supplier is because this the, that, that interim person is in business with the Social Security Institute or TPA but you get no response. No one informs you of the identity of the, um, of the supplier. Even you depend on the advocacy law, even you depend on freedom of information. There is a confidentiality umbrella. Nobody knows where it does come from and you, you can get no response. So if we go back to the current case, what happened in our case, uh, there is an innovator company which has a patent protecting, protecting use of an active ingredient in the treatment of a certain disease. And this product of the innovator company is supplied to Turkey via name patient program. So one morning, the innovator company wakes up and see that there's another product on the foreign drug list of the Ministry of Health, which has exactly the same active ingredient and aims to treat the same disease. So the patent infringement is clear. That's why the patent owner um, applies to the court against the manufacturing company. This is the only, uh, apart from TPI and TPA and the Social Security Institute, uh, the manufacturing company was the only actor that could be determined uh, by the um, innovator company. So a PI application was filed and the court was requested for the uh, determination of evidence because there was some other kind of information that needs to be gathered by the IP court and grant of an ex parte preliminary injunction basing on the information on the foreign drug list. Ex parte injunctions are, I think, almost impossible, very rare, very, very rare in Turkish law. But um, here the situation was uh, because the manufacturing company was located abroad, there must be an you know, international notification process which takes like five to six months and it has no, um, uh, how to say, it has no harmony with the nature of the precautionary injunction because the injunction has to be granted uh, urgently in order to, you know, to prevent the ongoing damages. Um, so the patent owner simultaneously asked the IP court to send a writ to the Social Security Institute and ask about the identity of the supplier as well. The IP court, interestingly, because there was no court expert examination in the indirect infringement case, you remember, but here the court ordered for an court appointed expert examination. So what the expert did basically, they uh, looked at the patent document and said that yes, it protects compound A. And then they just looked at the foreign drug list and in, on which it was said that the generic drug has the same compound. So the panel confirmed the patent infringement and upon this confirmation, an ex parte PI is granted to remove the pharmaceutical from foreign drug list of the Ministry of Health. And simultaneously, a writ was sent to the Social Security Institute to identify the supplier. And once the supplier is identified, the court um, granted an additional PI saying that the supplier company should be prevented from commercialization of the infringing product as well. So it was a very good example of overcoming the hurdles in patent infringement actions against generic products supplied via name patient program. And it was also very nice to see that uh, IP court did not hesitate to grant an ex parte injunction when the infringement is obvious. Um, so once again, I would like to turn to Ida about the situation regarding import of unlicensed pharmaceuticals to UK and patent infringement situation related with such products, if any. Thank you, Sinan. Um, next slide, please. Yep. So. Uh, similarly, in the UK, we have a regime uh, about the supply of unlicensed medicinal products for human use, and that's governed under Regulation 167 of the Human Medicines Regulation 2012. Um, essentially, the exemption applies to uh, medicinal products that are supplied in response to an unsolicited order that are manufactured and assembled in accordance with the uh, specification of a doctor or other authorised person and for use by a patient whose treatment that authorised person is directly responsible in order to fulfil the patient's special needs. And so products that are supplied in accordance with this regulation are commonly referred to as specials. As well as these requirements, um, the regulation sets out further conditions that must be satisfied. 
Uh, in the interests of time, and I know we want to save some time for questions, I might skip over the individual conditions. So if we could maybe go two slides uh, ahead, please. Um, it, and maybe another one, sorry. So the MHRA has issued guidance telling us a little bit about what special needs means. And importantly, it's special clinical needs. So it's not enough if there could be a cheaper or quicker uh, unlicensed drug. Um, no, in that case, that's, that's not sufficient according to the MHRA guidance. And it shouldn't be used, uh, the regime, where you can meet the needs of the patient with a licensed product, even if you're using a licensed product off-label. In that case, still, you should prefer to use the licensed product and not the unlicensed product. Um, we don't necessarily have any uh, examples of decisions where uh, an injunction has been obtained against an unlicensed product uh, through this system, but it, it, there is a decision which sort of indicates how the English courts are approaching the question of granting injunctions for life-saving medicine, and that could be indicative of the approach they might take in this situation. Uh, next slide, please. And that is the case of Evalve and Edwards. Evalve owned two patents, which were licensed to Abbott, and the patents protected devices that are used in the heart to treat mitral valve regurgitation. And that's basically where you have um, the valve on one part of the heart not closing fully and allowing the blood to flow back into the other section of the heart where it shouldn't go. And uh, so uh, Abbott sold a product uh, that had been on the market for this therapy for some time, but Edwards uh, launched a product called Pascal and Abbott argued it, infr it infringed. It was accepted by the court that it indeed did infringe. And then the question became, what should the appropriate remedy be in this situation? Um, Edwards, the party selling this infringing product, argued there shouldn't be a final injunction as it would be contrary to public interest. And it relied on um, evidence from some doctors that preferred using its product versus the patentee's product. But the patentee said there should, um, apologies, uh, Edwards, the infringing party said there should be no injunction or there should be an injunction with a carve out for its, its product where uh, doctors prefer that that uh, the circumstances justify using it or a, a carve out where the patentee's product has failed. Um, next slide, please. So uh, in March 2020, the court set out seven principles that should be applied when a party seeks to avoid a final injunction on the grounds of public interest. And overall, the base, the basic uh, conclusion of this is that an, a general injunction is a normal remedy and that actually an injunction does protect the interests of the public overall because it promotes the patent system that also promotes research and development. And the burden of proof is on the defendant to deviate from that general position. And then applying it to the facts, the judge actually granted a, an injunction with only a carve out for where the patentee's product didn't work. And it wasn't enough that some doctors might prefer the infringing um, uh, product you needed objective evidence that the infringing product was the only suitable treatment to justify using it. So I thought this could be an interesting indication for how the courts might approach injunctions in the context of uh, life-saving treatment. Yeah, it is quite interesting. Thank you, Ida. Thank you. Sure. So um, I think we completed summarizing our cases. So we will be uh, we will be having the Q&A session, I guess. So um, I need to see if we have any questions. So please feel free to send your questions to us. I can see there are some questions already. And one is for you, I said, but please, Ida, do not hesitate to comment. Uh, it says that can employers claim rights on the ideas that their workers want to patent based on the contract between them beforehand. Yeah, uh, the terms of the contract is so important as long as it includes, you know, fair and reasonable uh, payment conditions. Yes, it is possible. Yeah. Okay. How about in UK, Ida? So in our case, uh, this whether or not an employer is entitled to the invention, so whether the invention belongs to the employer actually is set out under the Act, the Patents Act. And in that respect, it doesn't really matter what's in the contract. So there are certain conditions in which an employee's invention automatically belongs to the employer under the Act. 
Um, and th these include considering whether the uh, invention came about during the course of the employee's normal duties or whether the employee had a special interest in furthering the uh, interests of the employer. So, uh, yeah, these are set out under the Act and, and actually the Act is what matters, not so much the contract. Okay, thank you. And there's another question about employee's invention again. It says that what were the criteria applied when raising the remuneration from 6,000 to 30,000? <laughs> Do you want very, to hear my <laughs> Yeah, it was a very good question. And also, uh, we also, uh, you know, ask us uh, ourselves, you know, how, what is the criteria? Actually, the, the only criteria, either IP law and implementation IP law says, must be a fair and reasonable amount. Since the result, uh, as we discussed, um, details, uh, you know, very, being very far from being uh, reasonable and fair, uh, the arbitrator just used his um, discretion and increased the amount uh, 6,000 to 30,000. So the only criteria I can say, fair and reasonable. Must and, be. Yeah, if I'm not mistaken, the rule was saying, there was this provision saying that depending on the discretion of the arbitrator or the judge, the amount can be increased, uh, and, I mean, uh, up to five times of the calculated amount. There was such a provision, right? Am I correct? Yeah, I or, think so, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it is. And just, um, um, you know... Yeah. Please go ahead, yeah. Yeah, I would I would uh, I would say that where where does it come from? This question asks, and I would say that from the heart of the arbitrator because it was so he, he we could understand he was so sorry about the outcome because he had to apply the regulation and as per to the calculation, uh, I mean defined in the regulation the outcome was this and he did what he can do at least. Okay, there is another question saying that about the, um, the about indirect use of invention. It says that if it is, uh, if there is any precedent decision uh, about indirect use of a Swiss type claim or EPC 2000 claims, are, as Ida uh, enlightened us about, uh, no, not in Turkish law. We came too close to have such a decision. But we couldn't because in one case there was a settlement, in another one the patent was invalidated, so we could not see anything about an indirect use uh, of invention in case of a, you know, Swiss type claim or EPC 2000 type use claim. Um, okay, another question for you, Isel, is it is about the warning letters, and yeah. it says that if it if the audience should understand um, sending warning letters are equal to unfair competition as per to Turkish law. No, 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 please don't get me wrong, not at <laughs> all, you know, it's not a, it's not a, you know, just warning letter, sending a warning letter is not a compulsory, you know, uh, it doesn't mean that it's, you know, equal to patent infringement or anything else. Okay, so you, you mean that this case was a bad luck? I mean, it's a very, you know, I, I, I can't say, it's best of all, uh, my knowledge, this is a, you know, first case I can say we, I, I you know, faced, uh, but I have a you know, huge hope from the district court that will, you know, turn over the decision of the first instance court. Okay, thank you. Ada, is there anything you want to add? Uh, no, that, that sounds good to me. Okay, um, I just realized that I should have scrolled up and because there are two more questions here. One says that, Curious as to the progress position, positioning of GUM partners in proceeding forward towards global IP protection and patenting. Hmm. So it is about our position. Okay. Well, first of all, um, we have uh, you know maybe you know maybe you know maybe you don't. We have a patent uh, uh, prosecution department. So, and in terms of the global IP protection, our department, when possible. Uh, advises our clients uh, to take the EPC route in terms of um, registration of patents, of course. But of course, there are some cases where the EPC may not be sufficient because you may also seek for uh, any protection in US or Japan, etc. Uh, in that case, we, we recommend most the Euro PCT applications, which means that we want to start with the EPC and then go with the PCT ones. Um, uh, this is uh, because, um, well, 
EPC is a, a kind of uh, clear, in compared to others, uh, clear weight for the persecution of patents. And uh, our law, the uh, IP law of Turkey, is more or less very in line with the EPC. So that's why we suggest taking that route. I hope it is a um, response to your question. I saw, is there anything you would like to yeah. add? Not really. <laughs> another one saying that what sort of precautionary injunction is available in a jurisdiction where a foreign applicant's patent was rejected, not granted? Hmm. Uh, well, uh, in the lack of the uh, existence of IP rights, we may depend on unfair competition uh, acts. I mean, the acts constituting unfair competition. In fact, we have a precedent case in which we uh, we were successful, you know, preventing the uh, other party who is copying the products of a client and only depending on the unfair competition provisions, we could seize all, uh, you know, the client, right, Asa? Uh, yeah. Just remember, yeah. yeah. Uh, so, yeah, depending on unfair competition acts uh, and actions, we can stop um, the other party who is copying or taking a benefit of the product or services of uh, the, the party who genuinely, genuinely uh, invented or you know put it on the market for the first time. Okay, uh, anything else to add from your side? Likewise, it would depend on what other rights are surrounding the the invention yeah. or, or 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 whatever it is that we're trying to protect here. So there there could be. Um, unregistered rights are arising automatically under common law, such as passing off, um, but it really would depend on the facts here. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so there's a follow-up question uh, from the from our co from the colleague who previously asked that what were the criteria applied when raising the remuneration from 6,000 to 30? And as follow-up question, he asks, so he did not like what it was and changed it purely on the basis of individual discretion. How do we now determine what is fair and reasonable? Well, yes, he changed it depending on his discretion, but as I tried to explain, there's a provision who, which uh, puts an upper limit uh, on the discretion of the arbitrator or the judge as well. Um, well, let's ask, how do, you, uh, how do you calculate what is fair and reasonable in UK, Ida? Because I can understand the thinking behind this question that, that being fair and reasonable is kind of subjective. And if there is no mathematical or objective calculation, it may, maybe this time it is not in favor of the employee but next time it may not be in favor of the employer. So I think the, the question tries to ask us uh, from an objective perspective, what is really fair? So that, that that's a very good question. And I think the UK's perspective here is very helpful. Uh, sure, please, I saw, go ahead. Sorry, before you move to uh, Ida, I want to just uh, make one little comment on the question uh, because, you know, um, uh, the in, the inventor, the employee, strongly requests the arbitrator not to apply the IP implementation law. Why he was insisting this? Because the ratio of the um, numbers are quite low. That's why it wasn't very surprised that the result will be like ridiculous because the ratio is quite you know uh, quite far from being reasonable. So. Uh, it needs to be, of course, you know, evaluated case by case. But in our case, in our case that I mentioned, uh, the patent product, patented product that was sold, 95% profit uh, profit margins. It was quite high, and the uh, gross net was uh, uh, nearly five million, five million Turkish liras. At the end, you are giving, you know, just uh, six thousand uh, Turkish liras, which wasn't even compensated. Uh, legal expenses, uh, all the litigation expenses of the uh, inventor. So uh, from that point of view, uh, I think we don't need to even look for the criteria. Uh, in the de details of the criteria, we can see the, the facts of the case. Thank you. Thank you, Aida. Thank you, Aysel. Um, there's a little bit of discretion involved in the UK position as well. I, I can say that uh, you, uh, Professor Shanks, in the case he asked for 10 to 20 percent, 
and the High Court awarded 3%, but then the Supreme Court raised that to 5%, having regard to each party's contributions. And, and importantly, the decision that actually Unilever PLC, whilst it did contribute, um, it wasn't only because of Unilever PLC's success that these, these patents resulted in some good uh, uh, license fees. And that's why the Supreme Court raised it from 3% to 5%. But ultimately, of course, there is a degree of discretion based on the facts at hand. Thank you, Aida. Um, another question is about, um, it's asking about the UK law and says that if you have knowledge on the matter, how could the difference between copyrights, copyrights and patent rights for employees be explained? It is my understanding that copyrights are considerably more understanding. So good question. Um, so copyright and patent rights arise in very different circumstances. So copyright is an automatically arising uh, right and it depends on different conditions to patents. Um, in the context of employee rights in particular, I have to say this is um, not within something I can I can tell you right now, but I could look into it if you'd like to um, uh, pick this up at, at maybe on email or something. But uh, yeah, it, it is a very different regime, patents versus copyright. Okay. Well, there seems to be no further question, if I'm not mistaken. I'm sorry, it's my first uh, run with the go to webinar. <laughs> so, but I think there is no other question. So maybe I should now hand over to Dan for closing remarks. And maybe then I will say all goodbye to our audience. Thank you very much, Celine. Yes, I, I think you handled that Q&A session uh, incredibly professionally. Uh, uh, that does seem to have um, completed all of the questions that we got in. If you do have further questions, you can always um, follow up and send over any that you have after the webinar. But I'd just like to say on behalf of everyone at Mondac, um, I'd like to thank our wonderful panel, Celine, Ida and Isil for a really fantastic webinar. There was a lot of great insight today and I'm sure that we're all a lot more knowledgeable for having listened. Um, just to make you all aware, Gunplus Partners are hosting a second World IP Day webinar with Mondac, a conversation on the significant role of IP on SME's growth. Um, that's on Thursday. Uh, please head to mondac.com if you would like to attend that session too. Um, but once again, I would like to thank our panel for their time and their knowledge today. And of course, to thank you for joining us. So um, I hope you all have a lovely evening. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, Dan. Thank you. I would also like to thank you for joining us. And um, I should say that I hope to have the next World IP Day event in a face-to-face -face meeting, hopefully, next year. Until then, I say goodbye, take care, and stay healthy. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.